So I'm basically going to give you everything I know and everything I've learned over the past 30 years of being in the field. Is that all right with you? There's this old man sitting in a doctor's reception area and the doctor calls him and it's a busy reception there are lots of people the doctor calls him and he gets up like this he's got a cane and he slowly walks into the doctor's room and 30 seconds later the door opens he walks out like this and everybody in the reception area goes what this guy do to you that's amazing he goes yeah he gave me a longer cane <laughs> so sometimes a simple solution is the best solution that makes sense? And so um, what, what I wanted to start with is telling you what the back is. Everyone thinks the back is just our lower back, but it's really the entire spine. And the spine needs to be looked at as a continuous organ, one continuous organ. It, does, it is divided into parts by name only, but it is one organ. And when you look at the anatomy of the human body, you get a good idea of what our creator was thinking when he built us because he wanted to protect the most important part of your body with bone. What's the part of your body that's almost completely surrounded by bone, protected by bone? Brain. Brain. And the brain, is, is the brain important? The most. I love that. Very good. I agree with you. And the second most protected part of your body is what? What's almost completely surrounded by bone, but not as much as the brain. What is it? Heart and lungs are protected by your rib cage, right? But believe it or not, the spinal cord is even more protected than the heart and lungs. See, it's almost completely surrounded by bone, right? And basically, the spinal cord is an extension of the brain. So the brain sends signals through the spine, and nerves transmit that information to the various organs, glands, blood vessels, muscles, tissues, and so on. So if the brain is the most important part of the body, and we know that because it's the most protected part of the body, the second most important part of your body is actually the spinal cord. Now, what happens to someone if they fall, they break their neck, and sever the spinal cord? Do they get paralyzed? Yeah. They get paralyzed. Do they get paralyzed just in the neck or from there down? Yeah. Absolutely. But what if, what if they fall off a horse, they don't break their neck, but they misalign something, and when they misalign it, it puts pressure on the spinal cord, but it doesn't break or sever the spinal cord, it's just putting pressure on the spinal cord. Is that going to just be a neck issue, or will that affect them from there down? Very neck issue. Neck issue. Actually, it's going to affect them from there down. Yeah, I have an example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think about uh, Christopher Reeve, the, uh, the actor who broke his neck, and he needed a ventilator to breathe. Uh, he needed a pacemaker on his heart for his heart to beat properly, and someone had to push on his abdomen every day to help him have a bowel movement because all those functions were lost when he broke his neck. And so it's very important that the brain communicates with the rest of the body. And so um, uh, we, uh, we want to define the word health with another word. So does anybody have a good definition of what health is? What's health? Well-being. Well-being, good. And what's well-being? Oh, awesome. I love that. That's, that's called circular reasoning. It works. It works un until it doesn't, right? So, so listen, I'll, I'll tell you a definition of health because if our definition of health, some people's definition of health is if I look good, I feel good, I'm healthy, right? And that's not necessarily the case because most people who have heart disease, they looked good and felt fine until they had a heart attack. And someone who gets diagnosed with cancer, they still looked good and felt good until they got diagnosed with cancer, and so we can't judge our health by that. So, so what's the true definition of health? It's one word, it's function. Function means your body is functioning the way it's supposed to. That means your immune system is functioning. Your cardiovascular system, heart and lungs, functioning. Your digestive system is functioning. Everything in your body is functioning the way it's supposed to in cooperation with everything else in the body, monitored and controlled by the brain. That makes sense? So if I say, what's health, you say, Function, that's the F word for today. Now, uh, you, you said well-being, and I like well-being. Well-being is a result of proper function, and then we're going to define what the word wellness means in a minute. But function is what we're looking for. What controls function is the nervous system. And so most people think chiropractic is for back pain. Unfortunately, that is not true. Chiropractic is based on the one premise that the human body is self-healing, self-regulating. That means your body knows how to heal a cut. You may need stitches, but the stitches don't heal that cut. 
your body heals it. And when you break a bone, even if you need a cast, even if you need rods and screws put in there, those bones grow back together and they fuse. So your body knows how to self-heal, self-regulate. What do I mean by regulate? It means if you need an enzyme, your body will produce it. If you need a hormone, your body will produce that as well. And if you have too much of something, it'll downregulate it. All those systems are being controlled by your nervous system. How important is it to have a functioning nervous system? Absolutely. And so if function is health, now what is stress? Does, this, does stress affect our health? Yes. 100%. So what's the definition of stress? It's another F word. All right. So who has a definition of their own personal stress? Like, how many of you think, oh, stress is, I just had a fight with my spouse, and now I'm all stressed out, and that's their definition of stress? What's that? No. Good. <laughs> right. Stre stress is all around us, right? Is anybody in here who doesn't have stress? Who has zero stress? Good. Because you wouldn't be alive. They took a group of amoeba, single cell organism, put them in a petri dish, and they took away all their stress, removed all stress. It means they gave them, you know, flat screen TVs and tempurpedic beds and gave them all the food and best temperature, all that stuff. And these cells, they all died. Without stress, we die. Stress sustains life. Stress is required for life. So we cannot be without stress. So you go, okay, well, I thought stress was a bad thing. It's not bad. Well, some people say, well, stress is a good thing. It's not good either. It's actually neutral. Stress is neutral. Stress is like gravity. Gravity keeps your feet on the ground, but it can cause you to fall and hurt yourself. You wouldn't say gravity is bad. Uh, stress is like fire. Fire can cook your food or burn your hand. Stress is like money. You go, oh, money can fund terrorist activity, or it can put your kids through college. Is money good or bad? It's a tool. And so stress is the same thing. So the F word for stress, definition of stress, is force. It's a force that causes change in your life. If I go to the gym and start lifting weights, am I stressing my body? Who says yes? Absolutely. And now, if I do it properly, will I get stronger and bigger? If I do it improperly, will I get injured? 100%. So it's just a force that causes, puts, uh, put. Uh, results in a change. The change can be good and the change can be bad. So all of you have that stress. You go, well, how can I use that stress to propel me towards success? Let's talk about that. And we're going to get into that. But uh, since I'm supposed to talk about stress first, that's the definition of stress. It's a force. So health is function. Stress is force, right? Now, uh, stress will... Let me, let me explain another concept to you. We all have the ability to adapt to stress. Does that make sense? Adaptation is key to survival. Some famous person said that. And, and so how do we know if we're adapting? We all have this thing called the general adaptation potential. It's our ability to adapt to a certain amount of stress. Now in our office, we measure that and we tell you exactly how much capability you have with adapting to stress. But just GAP, general adaptation potential, gap. So you've got a gap, right? Let's say it's this wide. That means you can handle this much stress safely. And when your stress level goes above that, now you are susceptible to illness and injury. That's, those are people who catch a cold in the summer when it's not cold. Those are people who have been down to pick up a cell phone or a, or a penny off the floor and they throw out their back. Those are people whose gap was low and their stress level was above that. Does that make sense? So when your stress level goes above your potential to adapt, you are susceptible to injury and illness if your stress level stays in that gap. Now here's the problem. If you constantly keep your stress lower than your potential to handle it, are you gonna get stronger or weaker? weaker. I mean, yeah, weaker, exactly. Because imagine if I go to the gym and every time I pick up weights, I pick up less weight than I did the day before. Eventually, the weight I used to be able to pick up, I can't pick up anymore. Because I keep getting, so I have to stress myself to adapt. So you've got to maintain your stress level at a certain level so your gap continues to expand and grow. So you become more resilient. Resilience is key to preventing injury. Now. Oh, tell me what's right. Load. Stre well, it, it depends. Stress is allostatic load, so you're right. The, you're right. The medical definition of stress is allostatic load. Allostatic load, you, correct. So, stress is neutral. The person who coined the word stress was Hans Selye, and he said it's, it's the non-responsive... Stress confusing because it's, it's, you know, the medical speaking 
It's illness, right? It's what? Illness. No, it's not. Illness is illness. Stress is not illness. Right. Well, we are, we all just said that lifting weights is stress on the body, right? What? Lifting oh, weights is stress load. on the body. Load. We can call it load. So 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 load is so so why don't we call it any load that can cause wear and tear, which is allostatic load. Now, um, stress comes to you in three different dimensions, just like health and wellness all have three dimensions to them. So one of those sources of stress is psycho-emotional. Does that make sense? which is anything that bothers you emotionally, that can be a source of stress which can result to a change. Now, some people will get emotionally stressed, right? And let, let's, let's say uh, they, they quit, they leave, they shut the doors and leave, they walk away. Some people get stressed, they innovate. They figure out a better way to do things and all of a sudden they thrive and they become better for it. So either way, it's how you handle it. So one dimension of stress is psycho-emotional. The second dimension is physical. Physical stress can be repetitive uh, microtrauma. It can be bad posture. It can be sitting for too long. It can be uh, bending and lifting too heavy. Uh, it can be car accidents. That's, that's physical stress. Anything that physically affects you is a physical load. And then there's the third one, which is chemical. There's actually chemical stress that can affect you. That means if you're eating food that has preservatives, um, if it has uh, pesticides and herbicides in it, if it's got any chemical that may not be absolutely healthy for you, that puts what's called a chemical load or chemical stress on your body. Does that make sense? And so for us to be able to achieve wellness, now we're going to define the word wellness. This one is not an F word. Wellness is the degree to which health and vitality is experienced in those three dimensions. Does that make sense? It's the degree, it's the amount of health and vitality that you experience in the three dimensions of life, which is also the three dimensions of load or the three dimensions of stress. And so those three dimensions we said are physical, emotional, and chemical. Now, how do you improve wellness? How do you increase? Wellness is not a destination, it's a direction, right? It's like east and west. How far can you go east? Forever. How do you know you've arrived? You never know. You just keep going. You just keep going. It's a direction. So wellness and illness are two continuums. Let's say you go that way, you're going towards illness. And you go that way, you're going towards wellness. And as, as you, you can keep going. There's no end to it. No one's going to say, I'm, I have too much wellness. And so, <laughs> so how you achieve wellness, here's the formula for it. Very, very simple. You need to improve in all three dimensions simultaneously. You ever meet people who like start exercising and they don't lose any weight? And then they go, oh, it's probably because I'm not eating right. So they start eating right and they're exercising. They still don't lose any weight. What's the problem? They're only addressing two of the dimensions. The third one is the emotional. You've got to address all three dimensions simultaneously, right? which is what, what my entire book is about. Um, both books I've written are about those three dimensions and how to achieve wellness. And so, because I, I have these people in our gym, they've been in front of, they're pedaling for like an hour. Every day I go in there, they're in there. And their bodies have, they've been in there for 10 years. Their bodies haven't changed. One of the reasons their bodies haven't changed is because while they're on that exercise equipment, they're watching TV. So their mind and body are disconnected. Their body is moving, their mind's not there. Now, you talk to any bodybuilder, they'll tell you about the mind muscle connection, which is very important. So, unless you visualize that muscle and you feel the contraction of that muscle, that muscle will not grow no matter what you're doing. You need to have mind body connection. That emotional component is powerful. So, that's the formula for wellness. Now, we're gonna talk about back safety because this needs to be working properly for you to be able to handle stress and load properly. Otherwise, you will not be able to adapt to it. And so when uh, uh, proper posture requires you to have certain curves. So everybody stand up. This is interactive. Good. And, and <laughs> uh, what I want you to do is just, just, just pair up if you want or three people or whatever. Look at each other. And what you're going to do is uh, face each other and look to see if their shoulders are level. So do it. Good. And if this. Good job. So first thing you want to see, make sure shoulders are level. And the next thing, you need to make sure 
pelvis. Make sure your pelvis is level. So, so just observe that. You can always look at yourself in the mirror as well. And then, and I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you the basics of this, right? The next thing is you want to make sure the head is centered over the shoulders. It's not tilted and it's not translated to one side or the other. All of that is important. Make sense? Then you're going to look at your partner from the side. Now from the side, the ear needs to be behind the shoulder. So this is called forward head posture. All right, you can all sit down. Okay. You can sit. Good job. So anytime, anytime the head sits forward compared to the shoulders, you're putting extra stress and extra, extra tension on the spinal cord. It also reduces blood flow to the brain. Now, when we sit too long, how many of you sit all day? Yeah, so, so, so we need to talk about how to set up your workstation because when the head goes forward like this, literally the nerves from the upper thoracic spine all go to your heart and lungs. So a lot of people with forward head posture have high blood pressure. That's a fact. And so you correct that curve, take pressure off the nerves, not only blood flow to the brain improves, everything about your health improves, including function of your heart and lungs. So how do you correct forward head posture? Uh, well, you need to set up your desk properly. So uh, one rule I want you to remember is, by the way, we are recording this talk. So the exercises I teach you, they're going to be on video. We're going to post it to our YouTube channel called Real Chiropractic. You'll be able to go on and watch all the videos and do them properly. And then I may directly direct you to other videos we have as well. So uh, when you're sitting at your desk, the one rule you have to obey is the 90-90-90 rule. That means your knees have to be at 90 degrees, your hips have to be at 90 degrees, and your elbows have to be at 90 degrees. Simple enough? Now, the next thing you have to make sure, two other things. Your elbows have to be supported. If your hand is on a mouse and your elbow is hanging in the air, this muscle is holding your arm up. This muscle will get tense and tight. You'll develop knots. Those knots will lead to tension headaches. And you end up getting headaches in the forehead, behind the eyes, and sometimes in the back of the head. Sometimes the back of the head tension headache is from one other thing. Your monitor is too low. Most people keep their monitor too low. When you sit really tall, 90, 90, 90, your eyes need to be at the center of your monitor. Most of you, your monitor's here, and you're looking down like this. And if you're like me, when I sit at my computer, I start out like this. Within five minutes, I'm doing this, <laughs> which is why all our computers over there are standing. Uh, but so I'll tell you one other rule. So you have the 990-90 rule, and I'm going to give you the 20-minute rule, which is most people, even if you have perfect posture, you are not able to keep that posture for longer than 20 minutes. And so every 20 minutes, what you're going to do is sit up and sit right back down. I mean, stand up and sit right back down. You're going to take a one-second break, and you reset, and then you can go again. Ideal. Now, it's really hard to interrupt your work, and I certainly don't want you to do that. Pick what's going to work for you. Although, uh, on the side, eyes get very tired as well when you're looking at a screen all day. Eye muscles relax when you look at something far away. So if every hour or so you can focus on something really, really far away for a few seconds and come back to your screen, your eyes will relax and rest. You'll be able to do it. Uh, but the, the, the rules of sitting are powerful. So if you already have forward head posture, the exercise I want you to do is called a chin tuck. And you're going to do two second hold, 10 repetitions. So all you do is you pull your, I'll show you from the front first, you pull your chin in. You don't look up, you don't look down. You pull your chin back and you squeeze as hard as you can. It makes you talk funny, but that's okay. Hold for two seconds and relax. So from the side, it looks like this. Two second hold, 10 times. Do that once a day. It'll bring your head back over your shoulders. Make sense? Yes. Any questions? Great. So now, 
there's one other exercise I'm going to teach you. Now, there's, there's many for pos proper posture. Remember, we talked about proper posture, right? By the way, look at, look at Charlie here. Do you guys see how from the front there's no curves? But from the side you have curves? That's Charlie's front. So his nose points that way. This is his backside. So pelvis has to be level. Spine needs to be straight. So when we x-ray patients, that's what we're looking for. We're looking at alignment of every single bone because every misalignment presses on a nerve. Every nerve interference affects function. Reduce function, health suffers. Symptoms are the last thing to show up. Pain is always the last thing to show up. It's also the first thing to leave. So a lot of people feel pain-free, they think they're okay, but their misalignments are still there. And so these curves, you go, why does the spine have curves? The spine has discs between the bones. Those discs allow for motion. Curves are shock absorbers. Watch this, when Charlie jumps and lands, the curve is what absorbs the shock. Does that make sense? Just like uh, if, if everybody would, would hold your finger straight up and hit it with the other hand, and then put a curve in there and hit it again, you can see that curve absorbs the shock. Now, when you sit all day, guess what happens? Your hamstrings get really tight, they pull on the back of your pelvis, and they tilt your pelvis back, and they flatten out your lower back. And when, the, when you lose the curve, you can't absorb shock properly. So then every step you take when you're walking, or if you jump, or if you run, or if you exercise of any kind, now the forces are not being absorbed by the curve, they're going into the discs. The discs start to wear out. And one of these days, Charlie will sneeze and blow a disc in his back. Or he'll bend down to pick up a pencil off the floor and he'll blow a disc. Is a pencil heavy enough to cause you to blow a disc in your back? Absolutely not, but you gotta have proper curvature, proper alignment. Just like when you hit a pothole with your car and you, you throw off the alignment on your car, do your tires wear out unevenly? And then you go to the mechanic, the mechanic goes, you need two new tires. You go, wait a minute, I got all four tires from the same place at the same time. Why are these two wearing out, not the others? It's because the alignment was off. Why is L5 disc wearing out, not the other discs? Because the alignment's off and it's putting unnecessary, unnecessary stress load on the wrong disc, on the one disc, as opposed to having that load spread throughout the entire spine. So alignment is key to function. Function is health. Wellness is improving your ability to handle stress in all three dimensions. Everything makes sense so far? So I'm gonna teach you one more exercise. For this one, I'm gonna use the help of Miss Gloria here. Uh, come on up here. So this exercise is called the first founder, and it's kind of a modified version of that. What we wanna do is improve the curve in your lower back and teach your muscles to hold it properly, right? So what you're gonna do is um, turn sideways, and you're gonna, uh, she's gonna bend forward without losing the curve in her lower back. So come to the center. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so bend forward. Mm -hmm. Good, and make sure there's a big curve right here. So arch back this way. Can you guys see how there's a curve through here? She has to maintain that. Now to exaggerate that curve, she's gonna bring her arms back, bend the elbows a little bit. Good, and listen, this will be on video, so you guys will watch this video, and you're going to do this exercise once a day, every day, just like the chin tuck. You can feel tension there, right? Mm -hmm. You want to increase a ton of tension on that lower back. All the muscles will tighten up. Then you're going to hold this posture, hold this tension, and slowly bring the arms all the way up. Straighten the elbows. Go as high as you can. You can see she's, she's shaking a little bit. These muscles are right now rock solid. They're protecting her. So that's the exercise. And if you can hold this for 10 seconds, I'll be very impressed. You can bring your arms back down. All right? So that's the exercise it's called the first founder position. You've got to do that every day. You'll protect, you'll build muscle in the lower back. You'll protect the curvature of your lower back. Now, if there is a pathologic problem in the spine, then this may not rebuild the curve, but at least it'll protect your spine. So this would be a great thing for you guys to do at least once a day. It's only 10 seconds, all right? Now I'm gonna teach you one last one that improves your posture. This is called the wall angel. Can you do, help me with that one too? We're gonna to find a wall and we're gonna get up against the wall. You guys, anybody do snow angels? Yeah. It's kind of the same thing, except you're not moving your arms up and down. So what you have to do is you have to have your feet about uh, uh, six to eight inches away from the wall and the knees are slightly bent. So you're gonna flatten out your low back and touch the low back to the wall. Then you're gonna pull the shoulders back and the head, make sure everything's touching the wall. Then you're gonna bring your arms up. So start high, there you go. And you wanna make sure your fingers, your wrists, your elbows, everything's touching the wall. Don't make faces. And, and uh, you all make faces too, don't worry. And what you gotta do now is you're gonna slide your arms down the wall without letting your low back come off the wall. 
and you're going to go, and this, this, she's making it look easy. This is really difficult. And see how your wrist is starting to come off? So now stop right there. Press for 10 seconds as hard as you can. I want you to turn purple with veins popping everywhere. All right, good job, thank you. So that's it, super simple. So I've given you three exercises. They will improve your posture. That is gonna keep your shoulders back, teach your shoulder blades to stabilize where they're supposed to be. It's a game changer. How many of you are gonna do it? One of you, okay, good. All right, thank you for... <laughs> so, all right, Ch Chin Tuck, first founder, Wall Angel. All right, just do those. All right, now there's so many other things, and we can talk about those uh, another time. Uh, and and uh, how many of you have to lift things uh, daily? Anybody have to bend down and lift stuff? All right, uh, bend your knees and keep your back flat. So just like we, just like we, we, when Gloria was doing that exercise, she kept her back straight. Don't curl like this when you're picking it up. Bend like this. Push the hips back. Bend the knees. Go down. Pick it up. Now, how do you rupture discs? Number one way to rupture a disc is to pick up a weight and twist. Rotation under load will tear your disc, whether right away or over time. So if you got Thanksgiving's coming up, if you're going to put the turkey on the table, you don't twist and put it on the table. You turn your whole body and put it on the table. Does that make sense? I got to give you a visual. Think of the turkey. And if you got the turkey here and you want to put it in the center of the table, this is too much load on your back. Put it on the edge of the table and slide it to the center. Does that make sense? Because this will hurt your back. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Very cool. And we're checking things off our list here. Um, we talked about comments. Okay. So one last couple other things. We're talking about stress now. When we are hit with emotional stress or anything that scares you or worries you, your body goes into something called fight or flight. Everybody experienced that in the past? How many of you have ever been in a near miss car accident? Does your heart race? Breathing goes up. Believe it or not, pupils dilate, right? Your blood, blood leaves your face, your hands and your feet, goes to your muscles. Digestion stops and your immune system stops as well. So if you're under chronic fight or flight, long-term fight or flight, your immune system is not working very well. Those are people who have chronic sinus infections. They get a sinus infection at least once a year, and they're chronically constipated. All the time they're constipated. Their bowels aren't working. In fact, they even get heartburn and indigestion because things don't move fast because they're always in fight or flight. So you've got to switch out of fight or flight. You can't stay in fight or flight long-term. How do you switch out? Well, let me ask you a question. If someone sneaks up behind you and pops a balloon, are you going to go, or are you going to go, yeah. inhale, right? That sudden inhale is the response to fight or flight. Now, now, when you find out that it wasn't a gunshot, it was actually just a balloon, and your best friend is behind you, and he was just trying to scare you, now you go, it's called a sigh of relief. That's the opposite of fight or flight is a slow exhale. So if you find that your body seems to be in a fight or flight state, how do you know? Those are people who can't fall asleep. You put your head on the pillow and the same dang thought rotates through your brain over and over. Have you, anybody experienced that? You're smiling. So yeah, so like you just, you're like, I can't shut off my mind. I'm tired, but I'm too tired to fall asleep. That's when you know your body's in fight or flight. Literally your physiology thinks you're being chased by a pack of hungry wolves you're not gonna be able to fall asleep. And so you've gotta shift out of fight or flight. So all you're gonna do, simple, you're gonna breathe in for a count of five, you're gonna exhale for a count of 10. Has to be the same rhythm. Exhale has to be literally exactly twice as long as inhale. So you go one, two, three, four, five, stop inhaling, start exhaling, one, two, three, four, all the way to 10. Do 10 of those, and if you're in bed, your head's on the pillow, and you're having trouble falling asleep, just do that. Just do that, 10 breaths, you will fall asleep. You probably won't hit number 10. You won't get to breath number 10. Your body will shift out of fight or flight and you'll go into a deep sleep. Now, if you're, if you're one of those people who can fall asleep just fine, but you wake up in the middle of the night and it's always the same time. It's like every night at 2.32 a.m. I wake up. That's a blood sugar issue. That's for another talk. Um, eating. How many of you eat while you work? Nobody, good. Oh, no. you, you actually, 
You actually like stop working, you put everything away, and you sit down and eat good. So um, a lot of people eat. <laughs> good. That's great. Doing it wrong. Listen, I'm going to tell you something that's controversial, but true. How you eat is more important than what you eat. Doesn't make sense, right? All right, think about it. If I am in a state of fight or flight, let's say I'm in my car, driving to work, I'm on the phone with somebody. Now there's hands free, so I'm on the phone, talking to a business associate, and I'm in traffic, and I'm late for the meeting I'm supposed to be at. Would you agree that my body's in a bit of fight or flight? And let's say at that moment, I pick up something to eat. And it's the healthiest food you can think of. Whatever your definition of a healthy food is, that's what I'm putting in my mouth. Is my body ready to receive food at that point? No, you're in fight or flight, your digestion's not working properly. That food is going to sit in your stomach and ferment. And it's going to splash up and cause acid reflux and heartburn and indigestion. Now, now the, way, the way I eat is I stop everything. If I'm in fight or flight, I may do a couple of breaths before I start eating. I say a prayer of gratitude, being thankful for it, and then I start eating. Sometimes I'll play Baroque classical music, which also helps shift your body out of fight or flight. And then you eat. Now you can eat something that may not be as healthy, but it'll still be processed properly by your body. I'm not telling you not to eat healthy. I'm just telling you, if you're eating healthy, but you're not eating the right way, you're wasting your time. You're still unhealthy. It's still not going to do good for you. Right? Why do people in France have immunity to obesity, heart disease? There's no cholesterol. There's, there's, there's no, no, no heart disease in, in France. Why is that? They got you, those cafes. They just sit there. They chill out. That's what they do. Have you been there? I've not it's been to France. I've been to your big cafe. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, so, so eating is a social thing in, in, uh, in France. And it, in fact, in kindergarten in the U.S., they tell the kids, stop talking, eat faster. That's what they tell the kids. In kindergarten in France, they go, why are you eating so fast? Talk to your friends. Because that's, that's their culture. Man, lunch takes an hour and a half. Dinner takes three hours. You got to dinner with your friends. Like, you're not going to a movie afterwards. You're not going to a play. I mean, dinner is the whole evening. And, and if you tell the waiter to bring your check when the food comes because you're in a hurry, the chef will spit in your food. So you... you, you <laughs> <laughs> so be careful. That's my tip for you if you go to France. So I, I spent like three weeks in France. That's how it was. And none of them have any heart disease. None of them. There's no, there's no issues. And none of them are obese. In fact, anybody you see that's overweight was, was a, probably a U.S. tourist that was in, in, in France. <laughs> so how you eat is more important than what you eat. Okay, eat healthy. Obviously, eat healthy. You, you all know what that is. Everybody knows how to eat healthy. But you got to do it with the right mindset. Make sense? And um, so, so listen, I'm, I'm going to wrap up because we're out of time. I'm actually three minutes over. Um, but I want you to, I want to save time for questions. Now, how does stress and health and all of that stuff relate to being successful? How many of you would, would enjoy additional success in your, in your world? Nobody? One person. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm just talking to you. Um, so success. Success requires you to be able to handle stress. So I'll give you an example. If someone wants to start a business, are they going to deal with some stress? For sure. Someone wants to advance in their career and go to the next level. Is, is their job going to get easier or harder? harder? Probably harder, which means they have to handle stress. Someone wants to get married. Is being married completely stress-free? They actually have more stress. And someone wants to have kids, does that bring less stress or more stress? Less. Right. And what if someone wants to go further in their education? They want to get another degree. Is that going to be totally stress-free? Okay, everything good in life comes with stress. So the secret is this. Because I've studied the ultra-healthy and the ultra-successful for 30 years. And you know what? They have one thing in common. What's... What do they have in common? They have actually three things in common. Number one, the people who are ultra successful, meaning like you see them, everything they touch turns to gold. They try different things. You look at them, you go, how do you fit all of this in your schedule? 
Like you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and you, all of it works out. And you take good care of your family, and you're a good parent, and you serve in church, and whatever. Like you're doing all this stuff. How do, how do, you, how do you do all that? Secret is this. The people who are ultra successful, number one, they have a different definition of stress. They don't say stress is bad. They don't say stress is good. They know that stress is a force that causes change in their life. And they know that whatever they do, so secret number two, number one is they have a different definition of stress. Number two, they have a different relationship with stress. They invite it. They know, hey, I want to increase my income. Guess what? How much money you make is determined by how much stress you can safely handle. Bottom line, you want to make more money? Take on more responsibilities. You want to take on more responsibilities? Get your body ready to handle the stress that's going to come with that. Because that stress will become easy. At first it's hard, but it becomes easy. And then you get better and you become more efficient. So you're not stagnant, stay in the same place for the rest of your life. That's number two. Number three, the ultra healthy and the ultra successful never, ever, ever focus on reducing stress. That's not their goal. Their goal is always to become more resilient and more adept and more capable of handling stress so that the weight they used to lift that seemed really heavy now feels light and easy. Now they're going to pick up this one. And when that gets easy, they pick up this one. Make sense? The number one reason people fail to succeed at what they want and what they want to do is because they're not equipped to handle the stress that's going to come their way as they pursue their ideal life and their dreams and their aspirations. Make sense? Why do people climb Mount Everest? Somebody says, I want to climb Mount Everest. Why do they do it? Is it because they want to get a picture at the summit? Or is it because the person who makes it down the mountain is a totally different person and they started climbing it? The person who started climbing it had no idea the challenges they were going to face. When they come back, they go, I just went through hell. Now I know I can handle anything. Extreme cold, low oxygen, physically challenged. That person now knows how to handle a whole lot more. I told you guys that we do, a, um, we do a test that will assess how much stress you can safely handle. That test is called heart rate variability. But it's a specific algorithm we use in mathematical formulas that will literally tell you if at rest your body is in fight or flight or not. And if it's in fight or flight, we can tell you how bad, how far it is. If it's in adrenal fatigue, because if you stay in fight or flight long enough, your adrenal glands will wear out and you become exhausted. So, so, so I'll tell you, um, if we don't have questions, I'm going to tell you the, the, the three stages of stress. First, you're wired. First thing, you get stressed out, you're angry, you're upset, you're worried, you're wired. Second is wired and tired. That's the person who has trouble falling asleep. And third is the person who's exhausted. That's the person who falls asleep all the time. They're watching a very powerfully exciting action movie and they fall asleep. That's the person who can drink coffee at night and still go to bed. That person has adrenal fatigue. That's the last stage. That person is much more susceptible to heart disease than the other two people. Your food cravings are also different. When you're first wired, your cravings are all sugar because your body needs a lot of energy. What happens is when you deplete your sugar stores and your glycogen stores, when you stay in that state of stress or fight or flight longer than a few weeks, now your body is going to crave two things, sugar and fat because you need triglycerides because that's a precursor to all the hormones like uh, cortisol and growth hormone and testosterone and estrogen and progesterone. And so your cravings shift. You, now you want sugar, but you want fat with it, which means ice cream and donuts. All right. So first you just sugar sh candy. You just want chocolate all the time. You just want you put a bowl of Skittles on your desk. It's gone by the end of the day. Now you want ice cream and donuts. And then the third person who's in chronic stress, exhausted all the time, that person is craving salty foods, potato chips and pretzels.